At the Home Depot, we make it easy to turn your to-do list into a done list with our speedy delivery options. Need something in a hurry? We offer next day and even same day delivery on a wide variety of products. The best part is you can order straight from your couch. Our team is ready to help and get your order to you same day if it's placed by 4 p.m. on select products. When shopping online, filter by delivery to see availability options. Delivery at the speed you need, only at the Home Depot. Falcons Audible presented by AT&T is back. We had a week off. We are rested. Um, kind of. Are we rested? We're fresh. We're, We're ready. Fresh. We're ready. We're, We're ready. ready to roll. We're refreshed. Uh, this is a post bye week edition of our Falcons Audible. So we will get into a couple of bye week scenarios, and then we will start looking forward to the opponent for this weekend, which will be the Los Angeles Chargers. First question to you guys. You guys still end up calling them, like, just in conversation, San Diego Chargers? Well, I, pl I, I played in San Diego with the Chargers, <laughs> so it's hard for me to shift the, and go to the L.A. Chargers all the time. Yeah, all the time. I mean, I played in Qualcomm Stadium. It's like I still to this day get caught up in in the Chargers and the Raiders, yeah. right? Like I still yeah. like in, it's an Oakland Raiders to me. It's San Diego Chargers to me. So relearn behaviors, if you will. It's, it's weird because I was just doing my stuff with Fox last night, and I'm writing in my script, and – I started saying, and I was like, hold on. <laughs> and I went to just check, just to make sure. I knew it was L.A., but I was like, let me just make sure. And I went back and looked. So, yeah, absolutely. I'm still think about so it. So, as uh, we get ready to prepare for the Los Angeles Chargers this weekend, first let's talk a little bit about bye week. I want you guys to put back your your player cap on, right? Not your broadcasting, not your <coughs> analyst cap. Put your player cap back on here. Not your player player cap, Arch. Not player, 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 player. Oh, player, yes. player. Okay. That, that, that's for after yeah. the show. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. for off the air. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, to tell our fans and our listeners that what is bye week like for a player? DJ, let me start with you. What did you do? Uh, what is a bye week like for a player? I think for most guys, it's an opportunity to get away because usually what happens is, guys, first part of the week, you get a little bit of work done. You, you start working towards next week. You put the last game behind you, and you probably go up to Wednesday. Some teams go up to, like, Thursday, but then you get the rest of that weekend off. And I think for a lot of guys, if you're able to, most guys get away. They may get away for a couple of days, may take a quick trip somewhere, or – uh, I know a lot of guys go back to their alma mater. We saw Kirk Cousins go back. We saw Bijan go back. So a lot of guys did that. I remember, I remember doing that when I was playing. Uh, but it's a chance just to get away and mentally and physically get away from the game. Because I think what people forget about is this has been going on since training camp. You start training camp, and then you get into the season. You got meetings. You got you got practice. You got more meetings. You got you know looking at film. You got more. You got all this stuff you're thinking about every single day. And for the Falcons, they've been going for 11 straight weeks. So you're thinking about the grind of it. And to be honest, even if you're a rookie or you're a tenure vet, it's still a grind as you get through a season and you just need that time. So it's good to kind of get away, take your mind away from it, get with family, get with friends, uh, allow yourself to relax, watch other people uh, kind of, you know, get nervous about what they're doing that weekend and just relax a little bit and spend time with people who obviously don't get a lot of time with you during the season. So that's kind of what I did. Um, I never really took a trip or anything. I just kind of – I stayed around, but I just didn't do much and kind of relaxed a little bit. Arch, can you remember back from the days on bye week and what was important to you? Well, first of all, we weren't soft enough – to have to have a bye week when I played. <laughs> so we played 16 straight games, and that included the four weeks of training camp, not that three weeks of training stupid. camp. Oh and there were 15 straight days of two-a-days mixed yeah. in there. Yeah. So that group was not as soft as this group is. No, I'm, I'm, I'm playing. I'm playing. this. You know, obviously there's a um, – there is a recharge of the battery we think about. There's there's a couple of trains of thought here that I go to from a from a player standpoint, and you guys had the bye week, and you can equate to this. But is you wanted to go and hang out and just unplug. I'm not preparing for a game. Right. I'm not looking at tape. I'm not in the weight room. Uh, probably might you know might do a little bit of working out just to kind of keep yourself keep yourself sharp. But everybody around me wants to talk football. <laughs> Every so, to, how much do you actually really unplug oh, no. when you got the Uncle Sam dude? I think you guys should run the ball more, yeah, man. I know what the deal. Is. Great, I mean, yeah. you, you there's, so there's no way to unplug there. <laughs> and I'm actually asking you guys. Yeah, we know Kirk Cousins, and Kirk Cousins is a is an outstanding quarterback, but a cerebral guy that's constantly thinking about matchups and. The, 
Do you think he really has the ability to unplug? No, I don't. I think I think Kirk at some point, not some point, multiple times last week was on that iPad. <laughs> yeah. He was on that iPad. He was doing the voice memos. <laughs> right. He was sending stuff to Drake London and Darnell Mooney. Now he might have went to go watch Michigan State or whatever it was, but I don't. I, I just don't think it's in yeah. his DNA. What do you think? But I also think about this, and this will come from, and this is what I think makes what's going on with technology and the world and everything. So it makes it better because when Kirk Cousins was on the Netflix show and you got a chance to see who he was. So before I seen that or knowing him how I know him now, I would have never guessed that every Tuesday he tries to do that in the season. He goes with his family, his kids, yeah. they go somewhere, they That's do something, call. and he gets away from it so that he can give his family that time. And before time, I wouldn't have thought that Kirk Cousins could unplug right, because right. we've talked to him a number of times and he seemed like a guy who – yeah, with my family, but then, oh, I got 20 minutes over here. I can go look at something where I can go ask some guys or go do some voice memos or something. But watching him there, I feel like he, he gives himself that opportunity to be able to do that. And I think for the most part, he tries to get away, but I think it still comes back to him because <laughs> of that guy in him that it's hard to really get away from it all totally. Well, I'll give you a little picture behind behind the curtain a little bit. I sat down with, as we're taping this on a Tuesday, I sat down with Raheem Morris yesterday for his coach's show, which we do on 92.9 the game here locally uh, with the Falcons. And uh, he's we, as we got ready to start, he says, I can't, he says, I'm expecting to get my text from Kirk Cousins. It's Monday. <laughs> and he says, because I sit down with Kirk every Monday and we talk about, you know, mm-hmm. what's coming up and all that kind of stuff. And I'm expecting to get it. And I said, well, maybe he's still in, in, in you know, buy mode. He goes, no. And just as we started to talk, his phone ding. <laughs> and he showed me, it was Kirk Cousins in text. He even said, hey, are we, when, when do you want me to be in your office so we can get, wow. so Kirk, yeah. As much as he unplugs, and that's a cool story, and yeah. I've forgotten about that shock with the, with the Netflix thing. If you haven't seen that, it's a really cool. It gives you an insight into Kirk Cousins and all. I think a lot of people know, but he doesn't unplug completely. Obviously, <laughs> can I make a confession? No, to you guys. Uh-oh. What's up? Uh-oh. I don't have Netflix. <laughs> what? <laughs> can I? <clears throat> can I borrow your login? <laughs> I'll be able to hook you. Up. Yeah, yeah. Be able to hook you up. I don't know why I look at it. It's just I've gotten to this point in my life where it you seems like you got other stuff though, don't you? It seems yes, it, yeah, I do. But it seems just like every where you turn, you can get a monthly payment, dude. Oh, and I need another question. monthly payment, like I need a root canal. No doubt. Says the guy that's going to the dentist well, today. At least you have listen. the discipline not to have it. <laughs> However, Shock and I don't have the discipline. <laughs> However, no. I do need to at see all. the series because I've talked to so many yeah, people, it's good. and they said it's very good. Mm-hmm. And I just I'm like I don't have Netflix. Sorry. <laughs> um, and, and and I know people are listening and watching being like, how does this dude not have Netflix? <laughs> Sorry. Um, here's what I will say. Uh, I'll, I'll say, in my opinion, bye weeks can be different depending on where you are in your career and your life. Mm-hmm. Because you guys talked a little bit about guys going back. And it's very common for guys to go back to if they're if their alma mater is playing a home game, they're going to go back and they're going to watch the game. They're going to be on the sideline. They're going to get introduced. And everybody's going to go wild, right? But I think a lot of times that happens early in their careers. Mm-hmm. When when you get older and you're married and you have kids, those are the times when, like, your kids don't necessarily want to go back to the college football <laughs> game. They want to go to Disney World. Or they right, want right. to go to Mexico or they yeah. want to go somewhere fun. True. So sometimes later in the career, guys are going with their families on vacation. They're going to soak up some sun somewhere. They're going to lay in a beach chair, maybe have one Mai Tai or so, and then – That's how they unplug. And to your point, Arch, maybe they get away a little bit and people aren't asking them about, well, what are we going to do about running the ball or interceptions or scoring defense, right? They're not getting as many questions as you are if you surround yourself in a stadium that's got eighty or 90,000 people in there and everybody's trying to get all on your shoulder and everything. So I think it does vary. Um, Some guys might like to get to Las Vegas and go have some fun out there, right? There's a lot of different hobbies that guys have that they like to get back to to truly unplug. Um, Let's see. I did do Las Vegas a little bit because that was a a good time for me when I was young and single (laughs) and had money and all that stuff, right? Right, like Um, the little blackjack. A little bit, a little bit (laughs) on the tables. (laughs) Uh, Just a little (laughs) bit. Uh, but I will tell you, I was a show guy, too. I've yeah. been to so many shows in Las Vegas. I'm okay to admit that, too. too. you got to be a grown man. I'm a big Vegas fan. Would you admit that you go to Las Vegas and you watch the shows? But yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. They That's are okay. very good. That's okay. <laughs> All right, so speaking of bye week, let's let's transition this to bye week slash on the football field. Um, 
What are some of the biggest changes that you need to see, DJ, with this Falcons team post bye week now? What are some of the things that the players were thinking about, coaches were thinking about, that they're going to get back to and practice this week that has to change for this final stretch of the season? Well, the other part about this bye week is as much as you try to get away, you think about all the things that through the first 11 weeks of the season – that you feel like you should improve on or could be better at. And there's so many little things that you look at and say, man, we could do this better. We could do that better. And as a guy watching, and especially watching the offense, I think it has to be third down offense. And we've talked about it for a long time about how you can be better. And a lot has to do with first and second down and, you know, how you start a ball game, how you start a series is a big deal. And I think before going into the bye week, I actually had the two losses before – uh, the last three ball games, you were not very good on third down uh, offense. 13 of 40 in the last three ball games on third down. Uh, you've given up 10 sacks in those ball games as well. So you're talking about opportunities that you could move the chains, or there's opportunities where you got behind the sticks and you didn't improve, or you got behind the sticks and it hampered you when it comes to you know scoring touchdowns or moving the football or just being efficient. And we saw that happen throughout uh, the season where there were moments where you have some procedural penalties that hurt you on first and second down. Or you get a nice run and here comes a holding call, here comes a false start. Those little small things you look back on and say, okay, well, the offense could have been a lot better, could have been better on third down if we were better on early down situations. So I think offensively, it starts with how you start a series is a big part of it. And then if you're behind the chains, it's going to hurt you. So I think third down offense is something you have to improve on going into uh, this latter part of the season because you're going to go against some teams who are going to score some points. And if you're you know, if you're behind the sticks, it's going to hurt you a lot. Yeah, we talked so much about third down kind of plague this team early in the season, and I think it got better throughout the year. But, Arch, I think that's part of the reason why it's such a difficult down in football because – First down is so important, and then first and second down penalties mm. all factor into your ability to have success mm -hmm. on third downs. There's so many things that happen on the first two plays of a drive that set you up to whether or not you even have success on third down. Is it third downs for you, or is it something else that you feel like needs to change post by for the Falcons? Well, I think that my eyes are going to go to the other side of the football. Mm -hmm. um, but interesting, just to go back to what you were talking about, Shock, how much – easier would it have been for players getting back to the bye week to unplug had they not lost the true. games going in yeah. so now the consternation and all the all the worry and stuff that you're attaching to the season magnifies i've yeah. only got six games left and i've got mm. two potential playoff teams coming up to start off the the bye week and we lost going in you know all, all that kind of stuff grinds but yeah third down certainly in in you guys talk about the early downs to get you to third down to where you can manageably maybe convert how about that equating to the next down where now in this this era of football where once you cross the 50 you're willing to go for it on fourth down if it's fourth and two fourth and three and if you can't get to that spot and it's third and eight and you throw an incompletion you're punting mm -hmm. so there's some some pieces to that as well i mean last night in the in and again we're taping on a tuesday last night fourth i down. think they went on fourth down on their own 19 yard line right. baltimore converted <laughs> yeah. On this, because that's where we're at. Yeah, I think the other side of the ball is where up my eyes go. Yeah. and what what are they doing from an adjustment standpoint? The thing that I think you got out of the uh, the bye week to me, and I hope, is the refreshing of bodies, because you were really beat up defensively. Mm -hmm. um, uh, an area of strength that we thought from a depth standpoint with the emergence of J.D. Bertrand in, in training camp, um, what we thought we were going to get from those three veteran guys, Troy Anderson, Landman, and Ellis, and then add Bertrand to that, all of a sudden became a, 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 a pile of strength there for you. If you felt, now all of a sudden, that, that, play, that group was beat up. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, Troy Anderson hasn't been able to play. J.T. Bertrand's been out for the concussion. And now all of a sudden, you got two guys playing – and in all honesty, I thought Landman and Ellis looked really tired in the Denver game. I thought they looked like they'd been run ragged a little bit. And both of them are nursing kind of little nagging injuries as yeah. well. I thought it affected them. I'm hoping, for me, I'm hoping that's what's refreshed and you come out. You also didn't have D. Alford and Mike Hughes on, yeah. the, on, on the secondary. Yeah. I think D. Alford is as important a player – to this defense as anybody on the in the group. Sure. We can talk about Bates and Simmons, the two great safeties. But I think what D. Alford does at the nickelback position to be able to play the two-way go there, you know how tough that is, right, Shock? And, sure. and then 
because you really, as much as you like, say, okay, we got a backup there, whether Antonio Hamilton can step in or Kevin King can step. They really can't play it the Who way he does. Also went it. down in Denver. Can't yeah, can't also went. <laughs> so you, they really can't play it as well. So for me, what the defensive side of the football, getting your people healthy and as as healthy as they can be, is Ruka Roro going to be a guy that can get back plugged in to that defensive front? Because I thought he was making some some things. And then what did we come up with from a defensive standpoint? They're not going to change their philosophy of how they play. But is there something that they learned in the bye week and the self scout that's going to allow them to not give up maybe the screen or mm-hmm. something like that? Because they've been touched up with that wide receiver screen. Dallas hurt them with it. Uh, Denver hurt them with it. Um, and some of the adjustments just from a tweak standpoint or from an X's and O's standpoint. Yeah, I'm going to stay with you quickly. I mean, you kind of went into more of the X's and O's and the Y's arch on the defensive side of the ball. But for me, we've talked so much this season about it being a bend but not break defense. But I think we've seen maybe a little bit more break over the last mm. few games than we yeah, did the bend, right? Sure. And I just think about the last two games going into the bye, right? You give up 20 points, you give up 38 points. It's 58 points in the last two games. Mm. It's 29 points per game in those two games, right? Right? So you look at Atlanta, where they stand right now, 25th in the NFL as a scoring defense, giving up 25 points per game. Mm. So what does that mean, right? Now you're putting the pressure back on Kirk Cousins that you got to score at least 26 if we're going to win the game. Very position. Right? So, you, so possessions become at a premium offensively. Whereas I feel like if that gets back to the focus, okay, bend but not break, and we got to keep people out of the end zone. we got to keep points off the board, Right. Then you get a little bit more leeway. Then you can have a little bit of a game where where maybe you win a 17-14 game. But how the defense was trending towards the last three, four games of the season, giving up too many points puts all that pressure back on the offense that they got to score every time they get the football. So that's an area where I feel like it needs to tighten up, which happens by hopefully getting guys back. You get depth. You get starters back in the lineup. But to me, that was part of the reason why we went into the bye week with a little bit of sour taste in our mouth because we let a couple a couple of opportunities slip through our hands that we felt probably with the way that we were trending before that, yeah. we had a pretty good chance of winning those games. So let's go ahead and talk about this weekend's action. We got the Chargers coming into the town, uh, into town. Seven and four, second in the AFC West, number one scoring defense in the NFL, um, just under 16 points a game. They got probably one of the bright young quarterbacks in the National Football League in Justin Herbert. Um, I actually did not see the finish to the game. Did he throw a pick last night or no? But at going into the game, he, he had did, 200 no. and 50 something straight passes without an interception. So doing a fantastic one job. Of the year, yeah. Uh, protecting the football. So, DJ, let me go to you. Like, what are some of the keys to this game, and how does Atlanta end up having a competitive game where they can come out of with a victory against an opponent that's coming in, even though they ended up losing against the Ravens, which is one of the better teams in the National Football League? This is still a really, really well-rounded football team. It is, and I guess you, you start with Herbert, and usually you do. You start with the quarterback of a football team, and they usually propel a team to where they end up going. And like you mentioned, he's played some really good football. Uh, he hasn't really turned the football over, and I think the, the thing that makes him – even more special is his ability to use his legs. And you can see it in the ball game last night. He's a third lean rusher. He's closer to 200 yards rushing. Uh, so he has that ability. One thing watching him last night, uh, even though, you know, they've given up, I think it's 25 sacks on the year or so, uh, his ability to move inside the pocket. Mm-hmm. And he can find little avenues. He can find, he can create, you know, ways to throw the football. And that helps that offense tremendously. And the other part about it is last night, you know, we don't know the status of him, but J.K. Dobbins goes yeah, down yeah. last night in the second quarter yep. with a knee injury, and you're not sure how that, you know, will, will be going forward. He was a big part of their offense. He was. Uh, a, a crucial piece into what they want to do, not just run the football, but similar to what we have in number seven is the guy's good out the backfield. Yeah. So that's another part of the ball, ball game that's going to be interesting to see if they can get him back if they don't. But then you think on the outside, they got a group of receivers on the outside that you got to pay attention to. Josh Palmer is a guy who has come on. He's making a lot of big plays for him. Quentin Johnson last night had a rough night uh, for him. Uh, obviously, he's a big-time receiver out of TCU, big, like 6'5", uh, has that body, has that size. They created opportunities for him. He dropped a couple balls last night. So you know coming into the next ball game when something like that happens, the focus is going to be a little bit higher. You got to worry about him. And then, obviously, my guy from Georgia and Ladd is leading their team. He's – they they – 
they, you know, went up in the draft to go get him. He's leading them in targets and yards and receptions. Uh, just seems like the reliable guy that Herbert looks for, especially on that money down we talked about on third down. One of the key cogs uh, for him on the outside just as a rookie. And this league, the tight end is not a bad player as well yeah. either. So this is an offense that absolutely is going to push the envelope. Uh, you talk about, you know, a team last couple of weeks that – team scoring this is a team that's going to they're going to push the ball vertically they got a quarterback who can move who can throw it around this will be a tough test for our defense it's a good test coming out of the break and this is a playoff team they're right in the middle of it just like we are so every single game matters for them every single game matters for us but the good thing about it is like we mentioned they played on Monday night it's going to be a shorter week for them and they got to crawl they got to travel across the country to Atlanta so you're hoping coming in that Maybe they have some heavy legs still coming yeah. in here. But this is an offensive unit that definitely uh, will get the attention of this entire staff and team because they played some good football so far. And they just ran into a team last night that's cooking on all cylinders right now in the Baltimore Ravens. Um, defensively, not to pigeonhole you if that's where you wanted to go, but they've got some pretty good names over on that <laughs> side of the ball when you look at Khalil Mack and mm. Bosa. Um, and they got a former Falcon, Bud Dupree, playing over there on that side of the ball as well. But, it, again, it's, this could be offense or defense, Arch, but what sticks out to you that maybe could be the biggest challenge for Atlanta when they're going up against the Chargers? Well, you talk about trends with our defense, and certainly the 4-for-4 four four in the red zone that Denver had against Atlanta yep. skews those numbers and puts the numbers where you were talking about 29 points per game, obviously giving up, what was it, 30, 38 points 38, to yeah. – to, uh, to the Denver team. Um, that's what's going on with their defense. If you look at their defense in the first uh, eight weeks or ten weeks of the season, they were giving up about 13 points per game. The last two weeks, they've been given up. They've given up 29 points per game defensively in their last two games. So they're trending in the wrong direction defensively as well. This is the number seven or number ten defense total defense uh, in the league. You mentioned they were the number one scoring defense. Uh, they're sixth in sacks, so this is a team that can get after you. And it's multiple guys. It's not just one guy. Mm-hmm. There's a number of guys getting after the passer, which is always dangerous. Uh, if you've got one sacker, then you got a way to chip him or get on him. But they've got multiple guys getting to the quarterback, which has caused caused a problem. But they are trending in the wrong direction. I think they probably know that. Um, and Like Shock says, that's something that, that will stick out to them, that rub them wrong, like Quentin Johnson dropping that little crossing route that oh. could have been a difference last night. He had a little crossing route that he could have caught that could have maybe got them in position to potentially send that game to overtime. The other piece of it, and Rack, I'll, I'll lean on you here, Darius Davis is as good as there is in the league in punt returns. Mm-hmm. He's averaging over 14 yards a return, and he had another one last night. I think he had about a 17, 18-yard return last night against Baltimore. In these kind of games, guys, you got two guy, two teams that are playoff caliber teams that are going head-to-head, and now we're going to sh- turn the turn the page to December, and you want to be playing meaningful ball in December, which Atlanta is in control of their own destiny all of a sudden, the little plays that creep up, yeah. the, the the special teams plays, a return where you can return it 18, 20 yards, all of a sudden that's two first downs the offense doesn't yep. have to get. Yep. Talk to me about that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the third phase of the game that we generally talk about only when it ends up hurting you, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And we talked about it a couple of weeks ago in the, in the Saints game, right? And we don't want to belabor that issue, but that's the reason why. This is a three-phase football game, and so often in the NFL, it's it's a quarterback ends up winning, or it's a it's a running back, a, a Derrick Henry or a Lamar Jackson dominates, and so all the focus is on the offense. Or a defense comes out and they have seven or eight sacks, and they were stifling, and the opposing offense couldn't do anything. But then there's always a few games that you look back and you say, we gave up three returns, we had a ball knocked loose on a punt, and we uh, missed three field goals, yeah. right? And then you realize well, how important that third phase of the game. You talked about it. If you have a good returner, you not only, like you said, you end up getting maybe a couple of free first downs, right, if you have an 18, 20-yard return. But then you think about field position, right? How much different is the drive when you start at your own 45 versus your own 20? How about right? the Washington-Dallas right? game? Yeah. That was all special teams. You're yeah. talking about a return from Turpin, and then yeah. obviously you come back and Washington has a crazy play to go tie it up, and 
you missed the extra point. Like, yeah. you don't talk about it until it comes up, so good You're point. Exactly. So, yeah, right. three-phase game, and, and, you, and you'll need somebody like Bradley Pinion to be on his game. And, and the best way to minimize a guy that's a good punt returner or kickoff returner is don't give him very many chances. If it's punt, you directional, you kick towards the sideline, you make sure that thing's got a nice five seconds of hang time on it, and your guys on the outside and the inside, they got to win. you got to get down in his face, right? But the moment you give outkick your coverage or somebody gets locked up at the line of scrimmage and a guy has space, he has room, they're electric athletes in this game, and they're going to find a way to make somebody were they, miss. Were there ever nervous moments for you like that where, you know, the guy out kicked his coverage and you're coming down and he's 15 yards away from you? Bro, you know some of the people that I had to cover? <laughs> right. Uh, right. Uh, right. Uh, need to tackle in those situations. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Man, some of the returners that were playing while I was – I mean, this is back during special teams was still like a thing. I mean, Name a couple of them, Rack. Name a couple of them who you, who you had to face. Oh, Ed Reed, uh, uh, Hester, yeah. uh, I mean, Brian Mitchell early in my career. I'm uh, trying to think of some other guys that were out there as well. Um, Hester was pretty good. Yeah, he, he worked yeah. out, right? Devin, yeah. yeah. yeah he worked did out they give him a gold jacket? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they did. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it was some pretty pretty good ones out there. Um, so l- let's let's talk about m- keys here, guys. We always talk about keys, but it's going to be there's going to be a couple of areas in this game where it's going to be big time that Atlanta either has success or they're able to shut something down. So I know again, I know we're early in the week and Tuesday as we tape here for a Sunday game, but DJ, let me start with you. A couple things that come to your mind for this matchup specifically that's going to have to happen for Atlanta to kind of wash those two losses away before the bye week, but to get back on the winning track against the Chargers. I think we go back and look at some of the previous games and guys who've had success or teams that had success, and I think you've given them kind of the two-way go at times. And I think you got to force this Chargers team to be one-dimensional, whether it's, you know, stopping the run or being really stout in the pass game without allowing the the deep shots or, you know, limiting those big-time plays. I think you got to force this Chargers team to be one-dimensional. And then here comes, okay, they have to throw it every single down or throw it more often because J.K. Dobbins is out or, you know, maybe, you know, I mean, Gus Edwards is not as good as he is, you know, when you're talking about coming out of the backfield. If you force them to be one-dimensional, guess what? You could change up your looks a lot more. Maybe you could drop more guys in coverage. Maybe this is an opportunity to Maybe you can finally get to the quarterback and get him on the ground because he's dropping back 45 times to throw the football. Or maybe our offense is putting up points, and guess what? We're up, uh, you know, 10, 12, 14 points it is, and they got to throw the football, and here comes, you know, our pass rushers showing up. Here comes Judah, here comes Grady, here come all the guys who we expected to have that kind of impact. And I think that could be a big part of the ballgame. You force them to be one to mention this ballgame. Don't give them that two-way go. Don't give them that, you know, the play action and be able to move around and all that kind of stuff. You get after Justin Herbert. You forced him to be one-dimensional. I think defensively, you got a good chance to to have a good plan versus. Him. So let me throw this out to you guys, right? Like we all know that the most basic and simple, and it doesn't matter what level you play at defensively or for a team, is you got to be able to stop the run, right? Like that's what every coach is going to tell you. You got to be able to stop the run, force him to be one-dimensional, just like you talked about. My question to you, Arch, is this. You got a quarterback in Justin Herbert that we know can make every single throw on the football field that has not turned the ball over this year. And DJ just talked about he's got three pretty good pretty good receivers. It's almost like in the NFL, if you face the wrong group, what I mean by group, I mean quarterback, even running back coming out of the backfield, but he's got multiple receivers and tight end as well, where that doesn't necessarily always hold true because Patrick Mahomes can kill you, Josh Allen can kill you, and Justin Herbert is a guy, too, that has the talent to where if you do shut down the run game, they might just go ahead and throw it 45 times mm-hmm. and put the game on his shoulders and feel pretty pretty good about their chances. Would you agree? Yeah, no question about it. And when you look at the tape, he's going to have a bunch of tape to look at where we've played veteran quarterbacks. And whether it's Patrick Mahomes willing to take what you give him or whether it's a young quarterback in Bo Nix that's willing to take what you give him, he's going to see that. And if he has to throw it 45 times and we're not making him hold the football, and he can drop the ball off, he's going to take a five-yard throw. Now that's just, just as good as turn around and handing it to Gus Edwards for five yards or J.K. Dobbins for five. Now I'm second and five, and I throw a little out route. Now it's third and two. Mm. You know, Now what it does do it, to me, and, and Shock, I'd be interested to hear what you think, is it makes you be – more perfect you got to be more precise you're not turning it around and handing it to a guy for three or four yards now you're trying to throw it and you and i both had coaches tell you hey when you throw the ball three things can happen and two of them are bad (laughs) you know so so if if they're not precise like you know quentin johnson drops a little shallow drag route where he may still be running if he caught it last night um 
you've got to be precise. You can't drop the football. So it makes you – but you've got to be willing to maybe hug them a little bit more if they're going to throw it, if you can take away the run like you're talking about, um, and make him hold the football. Also, you're going to have to bring your big boy pads this week. This dude's a big dude at quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not one of these kind of deals you're going to wrap him up and pull him down by an arm. Right. If you watched Baltimore last night, they sacked him four times. They probably should have had another five sacks, but he ran out of them. Yeah. So yeah. – you better better bring the pads. You better bring your arms. Better bring your body to put this big dude on the ground because he's going to be able to extend play. Right. Yeah. Let me ask you something. Yeah. There, as Arch is talking about, you know, being able to, you know, get these guys to the ground and all that kind of stuff. Uh, obviously, me and Arch have no uh, idea what this is like. What I'm about to ask you, but is it tough coming off a of bye week, or is it tough late in the year to still be good at tackling? Because obviously, as you get into the latter part of the season, it, some of the fundamentals go away, as we know. Yeah. Is it tougher to do that, or is it just a mindset thing of, hey, I got to go make this play, I get this guy to the ground? Yeah, I think it's a great point, and I think it, it's the latter. It has to be a mindset because of where we are now in the National Football League is. And, and I would say it might even be the same in college because, guys, when you get in this point in the season, in practice you ain't tackling. Yeah. Like, you're not doing it. Now, you might work on some drills where you're going up and you're fitting up against a bag or you're fitting up against a player, but it's not full speed. Right. And we know that's not realistic in a game. Nobody's ever standing there, right? <laughs> so it's it's mindset, it's focusing on technique, and then it's being a pro because you can't constantly work on tackling it's just yeah. it, it just doesn't happen so it's but it's all about form fitting right to your point like you can't go up and end up thinking that you're going to take somebody down with an arm tackle because you took the bad angle right and it's everybody working together right you don't want to have too many opportunities where you're making a solo open field tackle because we know the guys are electric in the nfl they're going to make the first person miss you can't have it just be one guy there to be able to make the tackle yeah to me that's the key when you talk about that and rack that's a great point is it's got to be a collaborative effort effort now. Sure, you're going to be one-on-one -on -one in space. People are always trying to get their best guy in space against somebody. But the way we play defense here, it is a collaborative 11 group, outside, inside, a guy over the top, and you need to tackle that way. And so you can't be laxed in your responsibility. If I'm supposed to be the outside guy, be the outside mm -hmm. guy. If I'm coming inside out, I've got to be there, you know, so my guy outside knows he can use the – but, you know, or you're using the boundaries and extra defender. So those techniques you're talking about in just simply tackling yeah. also have to equate to the, the concepts that we have defensively that help you get a guy on the ground because you got a lot of hats at the football. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, final question for you guys. Um, I'm gonna. It's a one- or two-word answer. <laughs> and Ooh, this is really hard for you guys, okay? I'm just saying. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give you the question, and then I'm going to let you think about it for a second. The Falcons will win. If all right, DJ, let them the, let the wheels turn a little bit because you're going first. One or two words: the Falcons will win if protect Kirk. How about that? I like it. Two words. Mm. Yeah, two words. Mm. He didn't even follow it up, Arch. I'm so proud of this dude yeah. right now. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm I'm a, a rule protect follower, man. Kirk. Okay, Arch, you're on the clock. Wow, wow. Yeah, not two, words, two, two words. words. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know I can match that. That's yeah, yeah. it. Name that tune in one word. <laughs> uh, uh, let's let's. So I need to try to jump to the other side of the ball then a little bit here. Um, nothing easy. Mm. Like it. Mm. Like it. Oh, oh, oh. All right, protect <laughs> Kirk. <laughs> Nothing easy. You're up. You guys got – was yours offense? Yeah, mine was defense. Okay, defense. defense. Okay, all right. So then I'm I'm going to be total picture. Okay. They execute. Ooh, they win if they execute. Ooh. We did it. Ooh. Oh, wow. That's right. Three, of, three for Six three, words. two words. Ooh. Falcons back in action this weekend. Real, Mercedes, quick, yeah. real quickly, though, we can't let you – I know you're wanting to sign us out. We're, we're Thanksgiving week here. Oh, and hopefully you guys are going to check us, check us out here before Good Thanksgiving. Good call. Favorite side dish? Favorite side dish is uh, green bean casserole for me. Nice. Oh, that's a uh, – Shock. I know Grandma's got something. 
I'm all about some good dressing. And I said dressing, not stuffing. Yes, God. <laughs> that is the yeah. call. Okay. <laughs> Cornbread dressing, baby. Okay. Cornbread dressing. Just, yeah. just had to throw a little Thanksgiving in there. I, I like love it. it. I, like I love it. it. Green bean like casserole, a little crusted, you know, dried onions on top, mm, and creamy. Nice. Look very nice. Nice. Already, hey, he in, he in heat mode already. Look at Let that. me get a drink. <laughs> my mouse, my mouse I don't know if I'm going to get it this week because I'm actually going to be uh, working an NFL game in Green Bay on Thanksgiving. So hopefully nice. whatever restaurant we go to is going to have my green bean casserole. Very hopefully. Yeah. you all have a very happy Thanksgiving. Uh, yeah, thank so thanks so guys. much for joining us here. As I mentioned, Falcons are back in action this weekend at home. Mercedes-Benz Stadium, 1 o'clock p.m. That game is on CBS. L.A. Chargers, hope you're watching it. We will all be there. Thanks so much for joining us here on Falcons Audible, presented by AT&T. We'll see you next week, everybody. Take care, and happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.